I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the 15th and final chapter of Schultz & Schultz's History of Modern Psychology. Today we'll be talking about continuing developments in psychology, or what's happened in psychology since 1950, mostly about the cognitive movement. Now the chapter begins with a vignette about Gary Kasparov being beaten by Deep Blue, the chess playing computer. But it then moves on to talking about the cognitive movement. Now by 1976, psychology was changing with a refocus on consciousness. And textbooks were revised so that the definition of psychology became the science of behavior and mental processes instead of just behavior. What were the antecedent influences on cognitive psychology? Obviously Wundt, who basically started the field, but Tolman too, because his purposive behaviorism and his emphasis on intervening variables as a way to operationally define internal, unobservable states of consciousness uh, was very important. The Gestalt School helped uh, keep alive at least a token interest in consciousness, and so we consider them to be an antecedent influence also. Jean Piaget did important work in children's cognitive stages. Now he had studied with Jung and Simon and his clinical method of interviewing children and his insistence on highly detailed note-taking were very influential. Also in physics, they had discarded the idea of total objectivity and they thought that knowledge is highly dependent on the observer. That's the influence of Ernst Mach. What about George Miller? Well, he was raised by Christian scientists who taught him that psychology is a sin. Uh, he went off to college, he majored in history and speech, but he married a psychology major and went to some of her classes and then he kind of got hooked. He gets his PhD in 1946 from Harvard and in 1951 publishes Language and Communication, which is considered to be a landmark book in psycholinguistics. In 1956, he publishes the article, The Magical Number Seven, Plus or Minus Two. Now, this is a classic study that was published in Psychological Review that demonstrated that our conscious capacity for short-term memory was limited to approximately seven chunks of information. In 1960, with his colleague Bruner, he established the Center for Cognitive Studies, and that was at Harvard they carefully chose the word cognitive to denote the subject matter. Now, it's important to point out that Miller did not consider cognitive to be a revolution. He called it an accretion, which is changed by slow growth or accumulation. He thought that it was a return to common sense psychology. And he was elected president of the APA in 1969, along with a number of other awards, including, uh, he also won the National Medal of Science in 1991. Ulrich Neisser was born in Germany, but he came to the United States with his parents when he was three. I guess he couldn't come by himself when he was three. He started at Harvard in physics, but he met Miller and then switched to psychology. He got his master's at Swarthmore with Kohler and then his PhD at Harvard in 1956. He saw no escape from behaviorism if he wanted an academic career, but luckily, his first academic job was at Brandeis when the chair of the department was Abraham Maslow. In 1967, he publishes the book Cognitive Psychology, which was extremely popular and presented this new approach. He said, quote, in the blink of an eye, there were cognitive journals, courses on cognition, and I myself was a star, introduced as the father of cognitive psychology. In 1976, he published Cognition and Reality, which was a uh, book that showed his growing dissatisfaction with the cognitive movement. He saw a narrowing of the cognitive position and a reliance on laboratory situations to collect data. Now, what Nicer wanted was uh, data collected in more real world situations. And he thought that cognitive psychology needed to be higher in ecological validity. He spent 17 years at Cornell, and then he moved to Emory, and then finished his career back at Cornell. From clocks to computers. Well, computers emerged as the new model for mental functioning. So storage is memory, programming codes are language, etc. 
Now, psychologists can, were interested in how the mind processes information, and so they looked at how computers process information too. That's, it's like clocks. Uh, so we switch from clocks to computers as our model, but it's sig significant to note that both clocks and computers are mechanical devices. So we're still working on this mechanistic model. The first computer is the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator, or ENIAC, and it was the first giant computer. It contained 17,468 vacuum tubes, weighed 30 tons, and calculated trajectories for artillery pieces during World War II. Five, or a few years later, in 1951, the Mathematical and Numerical Integrator and Calculator, or MANIAC, which is pictured to the right was created. Now it only weighed 1,000 pounds and any laptop today is about 100,000 times faster than the Maniac computer. Alan Turing is a very interesting person. He got a PhD from Princeton in 1938 and is considered one of the founders of computer science. He went to Bletchley Park in 1942 in order to break the German Enigma code. Uh, what he did was he brought together a group of cryptographers to break this secret code that the Germans were using. Uh, he actually started active work there in 1939 at the start of World War II. His group was successful though, and the Germans never found out that their code had been broken. He comes up with what he calls the Turing test, which is the question, are you communicating with a person or a computer? So you can think of it like instant messaging or texting. If a human can't distinguish between a computer's responses uh, or a human's responses, then the computer must be displaying intelligence at a human level. Now Searle, who's a philosopher, objects to this, and he devised his own thought experiment called the Chinese room problem. And he says, basically, if you put a person in a box and they don't understand Chinese, but uh, you give them a Chinese dictionary and they translate Chinese characters without un any understanding of the Chinese, then they can appear as if they understand Chinese, but really they don't understand anything. And he says that's basically what computers are doing, that they have no intelligence, they're simply following orders, they're what their programming tells them to do. Now Marvin Minsky, who's a famous computer scientist has also said, he dismisses the Chinese room problem. He says that no one ever calls a philosopher when they need to fix their computer. And there may be some truth to that. The Loebner Gold Prize Medal started in 1990. And it's basically a Turing test competition where, uh, for chatbots. And what they try to do is they try to pass, pass the Turing test. And there's an excellent book on it called uh, The Most Human Human. That's actually the book I give away to uh, students who've worked with me. To return to Turing though, he was arrested for gross indecency because being gay uh, in England at that time was considered a crime, if you can believe it. And he eventually committed suicide by uh, eating a poisoned apple. He had an odd fascination with the story of Snow White. To return to the beginning of this chapter though, you might ask, was Deep Blue, the chess playing computer that was able to beat Garry Kasparov, was it thinking? And most people would say no, even though it behaved as if it was. Well, what is the nature of cognitive psychology? What are some of the ways that psych cognitive psychology differs from behaviorism? Well, there's a focus on the process of knowing rather than responding to stimuli. So the important factors are mental processes and events, not stimulus response connections. And the emphasis is on mind, not on behavior. There's an interest in how the mind organizes experience. So Gestalt psychologists, as well as Piaget, argued for an innate tendency to organize conscious experiences into meaningful wholes and patterns. People actively and creatively arrange incoming stimuli. So we can deliberately choose to pay attention to some things and commit them to memory. A subfield, a hybrid discipline, is cognitive neuroscience. And uh, it's a hybrid discipline of cognitive psychology and neuroscience, not surprisingly. 
that maps the brain through sophisticated imaging techniques like PET scans and fMRIs. So personality traits like extroversion, conscientiousness, and agreeableness are found in particular areas of the brain. Now, a subfield of that is something called neuroprosthetics, which is where people can control robotic arms with their mind. And that's potentially a life-changing technology for people with disabilities. We can also talk about non-conscious processing. And this is a preferred term over unconscious processing because the word unconscious carries a lot of Freudian baggage with it. And the idea is that our, uh, much in information processing is done by the non-conscious and it may, more, it may operate more quickly and efficiently than the conscious mind. And a popular way of studying it is through subliminal activation where stimuli are presented below the subject's level of conscious awareness. How about animal cognition? Well, the return of interest in animal consciousness was given formal status with the start of the journal Animal Cognition in 1998. Now it's been found that animals are able to learn diverse and sophisticated concepts. So mental processes like coding and organizing symbols, the ability to form abstractions about space, time, and numbers, uh, the ability to perceive cause and effect relationships, create cognitive maps, and solve problems through reasoning. Parrots and dogs have been said to be intellectually comparable to a two to four year old human. There's even a spin-off field called Dognition. I kid you not, it exists. What about personalities? Well, sure, fish, spiders, octopi, farm animals, chimps, dogs, and a lot of other animals show uh, personality. A study that looked at orangutans found that orangutans rated high in extroversion and agreeableness and low in neuroticism were also rated high in subjective well-being, just like people. Now, the behaviorists, at least the few who are still around, feel that speculating about animal consciousness today is as ridiculous as it was 100 years ago. But you can make up your own mind. What's the current state? of cognitive psychology. There's more than 40 journals now dealing with cognitive psychology. And there's also the discipline of cognitive science. And that's a multidisciplinary approach to knowledge acquisition and includes the fields of psychology, linguistics, anthropology, philosophy, computer science, artificial intelligence, and the neurosciences. Really, the only thing that this new approach shares with behaviorism is the use of the experimental method. Another research area of interest is the idea of embedded cognition. And this is where perceptual and motor response systems affect, direct, and determine cognitive processes. So a, a way to think about this is, how do you teach a moving robot where it is? What kind of feedback is necessary? And that's a field called proprioception. And so, um, and actually that's really important if you want mobile robots too. One of the criticisms of cognitive psychology is what is it that all cognitive psychologists agree on? Is there anything? And I think a personal example uh, would suffice here. Now I teach cognitive science uh, as a class and I approach it, approach it from an artificial intelligence perspective because that's what I'm interested in. Another colleague teaching a different section at this same university of the same class teaches it as a class in consciousness. And I have a third colleague who teaches it as a class in cognitive development. So it's the same course title and completely different approaches to the material. We use different books, um, we lecture differently. Um, so it would really make you question, what do we agree on? Well, evolutionary psychology. Uh, there's a number of intriguing, I this is another course I teach. I teach evolutionary psychology too. And there's a number of intriguing findings in evolutionary psychology of things like mate selection, favoring blood relatives over strangers and aggression and when people are aggressive, uh, but you won't find them in this chapter. Evolutionary psychology has been called the second wave of the cognitive revolution 
where the first wave was the new emphasis on consciousness and artificial intelligence. Evolutionary psychology is based on the assumption that people with certain behavioral, cognitive, and affective tendencies were able to survive and raise kids, and that we're all descended from those people. One of the ideas is that we are shaped as much or more by biology than learning, and psychological mechanisms uh, originated from evolutionary processes which were successful in helping our ancestors to solve problems. What were the antecedent influences to evolutionary psychology? Well, obviously, Charles Darwin, and he's pictured there. Also, Harry Harlow. Harry Harlow famously showed that baby monkeys raised with artificial mothers would prefer the one covered in soft terry cloth to the wire one that provided food. So comfort is more important as a reinforcer than food is. Uh, Seligman, who we talked about in the previous chapter, also found that it was easy to condition people to be afraid of evolutionarily existential threats like snakes, insects, and heights, which supported an assertion of the same thing uh, by William James 100 years earlier. The book Sociobiology, A New Synthesis, was published in 1975. And Wilson proposed that there was actually a human nature that included things like a division of labor between the sexes, bonding between parents and children, tribalism, aggression over limited resources, and many other things. Now, many people objected to this because it made it seem like people were biologically programmed rather than able to exercise their free will. So nobody uses the term sociobiology anymore. You may well ask, what's the difference between sociobiology and evolutionary psychology? Well, sociobiologists would say that there is no difference, that the term evolutionary psychology is basically just marketing. Evolutionary psychologists, though, would say that sociobiology treated human beings too simplistically, that it was all about genes and trying to get your genes into the next generation. Well, let's conclude by saying that there is no end to psychology, that new schools arise, become the establishment, and are overthrown by even newer approaches. And that's the process of any science. So there's no completion, no finish, and no final state. Psychology is a never-ending process. Well, that's chapter 15, and thanks for listening.